Well, good evening. We are officially starting. I'll say it again. Good evening. I mean, we do exist. <laughs> That's encouraging. So glad to see that people are real live people still, not just behind a screen. Well, the first thing I'd like to do is welcome you all, and uh, we're glad that we can be together, and we, we were able to manage all of this. Um, uh, Jim, you know, is such a godly person. He was asking the Lord for the right amount of shade, and uh, he was blessed. Despite the fact that Marty Hartzell, wherever he is, right here, buddy. doubted. <laughs> But that's okay. We love you anyway. This is Grace Bible Church after all. <laughs> so we welcome you and uh, we're going to honor the graduates at this point. And what I'd like to do uh, for a short period, if you're here tonight, um, I want to, to go ahead and come up. Um, Heather Hall graduated from Chat State. This is in your bulletin, by the way, if you'd like to find that. Um, Caitlin Brown, who's actually having her graduation party at the very moment, uh, won't be able to be here. Jonathan Owens from Ray County Academy, Kayla Tran from Bryan College, Isaac Hendricks, Jonathan Hostetler, both from Bryan College, Emily Weinzeffel uh, from Bryan College, got her master's, DeAsia Suggs, and Ellie Reed, both homeschooled. Come on up. I'm gonna have everybody come on up. I'm not gonna have you say anything. It's okay. Oh, that, that's when everybody stood up. That was great. All right, come on up so y'all can be seen and grab your uh, gifts. I don't know where they got put. Oh, there they are, okay. All right. Yeah, just kind of spread out, that's fine. Is that Emily under the mask? Okay. Oh, yep, yeah, it is, okay. I didn't know if she had a stand in or. Well, we wanted to uh, congratulate you guys on a job well done in the midst of a very difficult and no one could have foreseen this semester, right? Uh, and the problem with this pandemic is we are often focused on how it is affecting us, uh, and we forget sometimes, at least I did, uh, that everyone is affected, and, uh, and everyone has to maneuver this, uh, and this is a global issue. And, uh, you know, when we think about it, for graduates, though, uh, you know, we, we just, uh, it was kind of an issue doing the online transition, and I can only imagine what it was like for, you know, teachers and administrators to have to facilitate that. Uh, but when you think about what it's going to be like to walk across the stage, uh, to have your family and friends there and watch you graduate, you know, it's, it could be a difficult um, situation. So, uh, but I wanted to uh, leave you with just uh, that we love you all. We want to give you a congratulations. Uh, just to give you, this is a spoiler, uh, so when you open the gift, you're not going to be surprised. So sorry, I do that every year, but uh, I wanted to tell you why. Uh, we got you the gifts that we got you. Um, the first one, which is the most important, is uh, is actually a copy of the New Testament, which is, uh, uh, I've got one, actually, thank you. Uh, the, the, it's a copy of the New Testament, but it's a great first study, and it, because every line is double-spaced, uh, there's room for margin and uh, for notes, underlining, all of that. It's a great uh, opportunity. And, uh,
as you deserve in great worship. We lift your name up. We lift your name up high in public, out loud tonight. You deserve it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I am so glad to be looking at faces now. I've spent the last three months singing to a video camera, and I tell you, it's not near as fun. Um, if you are able, will you stand and let's lift our voices to the Lord and let's celebrate us being together to worship the Lord as one body today.
supremely let us love each other too let us love and pray for sinners till our god makes all things new then he'll call us home to heaven the table will sit down christ will gird himself and serve us with sweet manna all Praise the Lord for the opportunity to worship together. One of the things that is uh, missing about uh, worshiping all separated in different places uh, is the visible unity of the body of Christ. And communion is one of those times where we're aware that according to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we've all been baptized into one spirit. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we usually turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, but turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and uh, there are some instructions there, some guidelines about taking the Lord's Supper. You may remember that this is in a passage that warns the church at Corinth on the basis of what happened to Israel. All these things happened to them as examples for us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And we're supposed to learn from the things that were written before. And as he's coming to a conclusion of uh, that little sermon in 1 Corinthians 10, he says this in verses 14 through 17. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. In other words, there is a unity that is deeper than the symbols that we're involved in. And some people say, well, you know, I don't need, uh, you know, to go to church, or I don't need to you know, go through baptism or the Lord's Supper because those are just symbols. Well, there's a scripture that says what God has joined together, let not man separate. In other words, if you are a partaker of the spiritual reality of union with Christ, you automatically have a union with other believers because... And sinners plunged beneath that flood. Blue 
that if you put your faith in him to save you from your sins, this table is a celebration for you. So go ahead and take off that top layer and uh, do not eat that cellophane. <laughs> and I've asked uh, Keith Hall if you would uh, lead us in thanks for the bread. Pray. Father, we're so thankful for uh, your body that you give up. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. The cup of blessing, which we bless, is it not the communion, the fellowship, the sharing of the blood of Christ? John Green, if you'll lead us in thanks for the cup. We do thank you, Lord, for coming down and dying on the cross and shedding your blood that we may be white and sinless. We also pray that you would protect us during this time uh, and 
protect us from disease, especially in this church. Amen. Go ahead and remove the top from your communion cup if you haven't done so already. Leviticus 17.11 says, The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Let's drink together. This time, um, we're going to um, look to the Lord in intercessory prayer and um, thank you so many of you who participated in our 24-hour prayer vigil. Uh, and we trust that getting together uh, for uh, 24 hours of prayer here at our church, and we had somebody covering uh, every half hour, so we had 48 slots covered uh, by you. But uh, getting together like that is just actually a beginning. And some of you may remember 9-11 when the Twin Towers fell, and it was often noticed in the media that churches were responding with prayer. Some of you were alive in 1968. I was. I was one. Uh, and I don't remember. Uh, but I'm told by people who were there and remember that uh, the events that followed the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy, the churches responded with prayer. I'm not hearing that now. And maybe it's that it's not being reported. But I would just ask, can we double down on crying out to God? And don't let our Thursday to Friday prayer vigil be the end, but by God's grace, the beginning of, of a new uh, outpouring of prayer. Uh, John Hostetler shared with me how there was a pastor who came to his church as a boy and had a burden to see people saved and invited the church to pray that people would be saved. And John traces his salvation, his coming to faith in Jesus Christ as a response to that prayer movement. Some of you know the community led by Nicholas Zinzendorf in Herrenhut, Germany. And there was a prayer meeting there that lasted 100 years. That's, that's a long prayer meeting. I hope they had child care. Uh, there was nonstop prayer at the Moravian community in Herrenhut for 100 years. There was always someone praying in the chapel. And many people trace the outpouring of Protestant missions that goes on to this day to that prayer meeting and two of those Moravians, they sent out two of their own men who sold themselves into slavery in the West Indies uh, to reach people who needed to hear good news. And so may the Lord give us a spirit to pray. We're praying especially this week for the Van Ostens, Eric and Christy, and uh, I'll lead us in prayer for them and other needs. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunities we have to um, pray uh, separately and Father, would you pour out on us a spirit of intercession that, Father, we would not be content to just uh, give thanks for the food and uh, make it through maybe some um, perfunctory prayer, but, Father, we would, uh, would have our hearts burdened with uh, what you're burdened about, that we would see people, that we would see the afflictions of the afflicted, that we would see the needs of our country, that we would see the families who are grieving losses for what they are. And Father, be moved to cry out and, and from prayer to uh, repent and to uh, follow you in a new way. And Father, we know as a church we're, um, Lord, we're saddened to see certain ministries uh, suspended and, and we long to get together again for Moms for Moms and for Awana and for our prison ministry and for the camps at Sedine uh, Bible Mission and the camps at Cumberland Springs and uh, Lord, the, the outreach ministries that uh, others are involved in uh, that I'm forgetting. Father, we pray that you would help us to seize the opportunities around us to be witnesses to those under our own roof, the people in our neighborhoods. Uh, Father, to take advantage of every means to let our light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify you. Father, we see many friends here tonight. We pray for the people who are not here, who are hurting. Father, we lift up Margie Snyder and ask you to heal her. We uh, lift up uh, Glenn Linebaugh and Pat, have mercy on them, and uh, Paul Price. And uh, thank you, Father, for the great uh, longevity you've given Grace Thompson as she celebrates 98 years this Wednesday. Thank you, Father, for uh, raising up uh, many 
we pray for Pastor Dave as he gets ready for this spinal fusion that he's waited on. And uh, Lord, so uh, many others that have needs uh, perhaps not said out loud here with us and not with us. We pray for Eric and Christy. We lift them up to you, Lord. And uh, Father, thank you for the amazing outreach of Wycliffe Bible Translators and for, uh, Lord, the, the ministries that are innovative that take advantage of technology, the uh, Bible Earth website, BibleEarth.org, which has um, just thousands of languages of your word and of the Jesus movie and so many resources. And thank you for Eric and Christie's role in bringing your word, your gospel to the nations. Thank you, Lord, for the beauty of the flowers and the things their boys have been able to participate in for MKs and for, uh, Lord, the new introduction in Portuguese and English to the Jesus movie, the Old Testament background. Father, I pray that you'd help them as they... Um, Oh, Lord, our burden for the indigenous friends and colleagues in Brazil. And uh, Lord, that you would strengthen those students who maybe don't have as much missionary support right now and who are being hit hard, especially in the country of Brazil. Father, show Eric and Christy what they should be doing during these days, as well as our other missionaries. And Lord, lead them by your Holy Spirit. Fathers, we pray tonight, uh, you know the uh, burdens that each one of us has brought here tonight. We lift them up to you. These are our evening prayers. We lift them up to you, through our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He matured and there was something about his maturity uh, that was winsome. And as we watched these six graduates stand up and as we heard the roll call of other graduates, it's really amazing to uh, now we get to see you children when you're in utero and you're just uh, there, uh, you know, doing backflips in mom's tummy. And we get to see this go on. It's really amazing, though, to watch you mature and develop. And we know... Uh, just uh, from research that all of the details about your genetic structure are there from conception. Life begins at conception. And so as we uh, care about uh, human beings, we know that you're on your way to developing and praise God for the people who um, did not give up on us when we were uh, making a mess in the sandbox and uh, you know, uh, not very mature. And, and uh, it's not a compliment when, so, when your big sister says to you, oh, you're so immature. We don't want to stay childish. We want to stay childlike. We want to stay fresh and responsive the way you children are. And you bless our hearts with your childlike faith, your childlike love, and the affection that you show. Uh, you're, you're clean in the way that you bring that uh, to us. But we don't want to stay childish. We want to mature to a place of perfect love. Perfect love. Perfect love. That's our sermon title tonight because John talks about that in our passage. The goal. You had one job, the saying goes. You've heard maybe that in a movie or in a, in a play. You just had one job. And, of course, the... the sequel is, and you fouled it up, you messed it up. What's your one job as a human being? John is just consumed with the wonder, what kind of love is it that we should be called the children of God? Beloved, it does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. John is in rapture about this amazing thing that takes clay and earth and dust and raises it up to the throne of God. You had one job as a human being. And if you miss it, 
You miss your purpose. Your one job is to shine in the image and likeness of God. And in that great interpretation in Matthew chapter 13 of the parable of the wheat and the tares, he says the righteous will shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Daniel 12, 3 says, And those who are wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That is your destiny to shine in the image of God. You were made for this. Now, a certain presidential candidate who shall remain nameless got in trouble with the media because as he was talking about the presidency, he said, I was born for this. Now, uh, I don't know if that sounds proud to you, but it did to uh, many of the chattering class, and they were upset that he felt like he was entitled to be president. Well, you know what? You are entitled to grow up into the image and likeness of God. And John is repeating himself. He's been meditating on love ever since chapter the beginning of chapter 3 and telling us that you've got to show the family likeness. And it's not this pretend love. It's love that's real. And if you can pass by your brother who has needs that you can meet, how does the love of God dwell in you? And when you find yourself running out of love, go to the source. Get under the waterfall because it's not in you to begin with. It's in Christ and you are in Him. There is this need to test the spirits as Brother Eric shared, to test the spirits. And one of the main ways that you can test them is that any confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and nor is he who does not love his brother. You can't, or at least we shouldn't, separate right belief from right behavior, or right creed from right conduct. And when we separate creed from conduct, it stinks. It's noxious. Did any of you see the dead deer that was at, uh, uh, what's that restaurant that's closed there, Bimbo's? I hope it's not Jimbo's. But, you know, <laughs> there was a carcass there for like 18 hours last week, and you could smell it through your windshield. It was awful. It, it reeked. In our passage tonight, John says, If you say you love God, whom you cannot see, and hate your brother, whom you can't see, liar! You're a liar. Strong language, and it's the third time John has said it. But you're probably lying to yourself. I'm probably lying to myself when I sign my name on the creed and then mistreat the person right in front of me. When he becomes invisible. Well, I love God. But in a mysterious way, the person right in front of me has become the invisible man. I fail to love him. We are called to abide in God's love because judgment day is coming. Now, you know, we are very uh, sometimes a little bit glib about saying, well, all my sins are forgiven. I'm justified by grace through faith. And we forget the strong language about the judgment seat of Christ that as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Or 1 Corinthians 3 that says, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. If any man build on this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, he shall receive a reward. Each man's work will become evident because it will be tried by fire. The day will declare it. But if any man build on this foundation wood, hay, and straw, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. You see, the consequence of failing to mature is not being able to approach that throne, that judgment seat of Christ, with confidence. When Jesus appears, the only category of people who will be saved is people who are saved by grace through faith. This is not salvation by works. But do you want to be confident? Do you want to be glad about that appearing? Matthew chapter 24 verse 30 says that then the earth will see the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens and the whole earth shall mourn. Some of the church fathers 
uh, the early Christians in the early centuries believed it would be a cross of fire. I don't know where they got that. But a fiery cross appearing in the black vault of the heavens. We don't know what that sign will be. But it says there will be a tremendous morning. But John says, I want something better for you. And it's reachable. It's possible. Perfect love is your one job. Now, don't get discouraged. When we say perfect, we don't mean flawless. What we mean is mature, complete, like these graduates that we saw up here just a moment ago. Turn to 1 John chapter 4, and we'll look at these six verses, verses 16, and actually five and a half verses, 16b through 21. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16b. First John 4, verse 16, I'm starting with the phrase, God is love. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Someone says, I love God and hates his brother. He is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. In this passage, we're going to learn about abiding in God's love. And we're going to learn to do that. We need to live the condition, verse 16. We're going to learn to live the condition, and you could add the word constantly, constantly. Constant abiding, as the hymn talks about. Number two, we're going to talk about abiding in God's love by learning the confidence in verses 17 and 18. You could add the word fearlessly. There is a fearlessness that comes about as we mature. And number three, we're going to abide in God's love as we leave the contradiction, or you could write there next to that, consistently. We're going to talk about loving persistently, fearlessly, and consistently. Uh, constantly, I should say, fearlessly and consistently. Jesus says in John 17, 26, I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. Now, uh, do you remember the little mathematical equation for remembering the two places in the Bible that it says God is love? What is four times two? That's a little bit feeble. What's four times two? Okay, what's eight times two? Some people I had their foot had their phones out. Uh, doing that, get the calculator there. Uh, God's word says that God is love in 1 John 4, 8 and 1 John 4, 16. He's reminding us of this so that we can check ourselves, so that we can constantly remind ourselves that, oh yes, if I am a disciple of Jesus, if I have been born of God, God is my Father, there is something about his character that I have got to show because I can give my body to be burned, I can give all my goods to feed the poor, I can have faith to remove mountains, I could have all knowledge. I could speak in the tongues of men and of angels. And what it is amount to? Do you know what your calculator is going to come up with? If you don't have love, your calculator says it's worth what? Zero. Zero. Nothing. And so love is the maturity of Christian character. And John knows that. John was there when Jesus said a new commandment, I give you. John was the one who wrote those words. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. And he wants us to live this constantly to abide in it to live in it uh, we've been hearing from the college where we're supposed to drop off our daughter August 19th that we're just supposed to uh, slow down 
and uh, come to about 10 miles an hour and throw her out the door and throw her belongings out and not darken their campus with all the pathogens we're carrying. Uh, but uh, she's not supposed to bring much either. She's supposed to just kind of be a, a temporary resident there. Well, sometimes that's what my love looks like. It's a little momentary hummingbird where there's a little bit of sweetness and then I go back to being selfish. John says, God is love. And he who abides in love, verse 16, abides in God and God in him. Some of you, uh, and I've probably told this story before, but um, there was an education professor who was a friend of mine here years ago named Malcolm Fari. And when Dr. Fari lost a four-year-old um, to death, he would tell the story that uh, many, many people came to his aid and many, many people um, asked, how can I help you? What can we do to help you? But he said some people just jumped in without being asked. And he said he was in his house grieving and not knowing what to do when he heard a lawnmower start up outside. Who was mowing the Fari's lawn? Well, I don't know the name of who it was. It's probably a good thing, take away some of his reward if I said it out loud. But I want to say on the basis of this verse that it was God. It was God showing up in the Fari's grief. And when you love other people, the scripture says God is abiding in you. We read about the heroes of the Old Testament and Judges 6.34 says the spirit wore Gideon. The spirit put Gideon on like a glove and used him to win a victory. That's what's going on when we sacrificially love people. Now, um, there's a little letter that you may be acquainted with um, that is famous. Um, right after protesters were arrested in Birmingham, Alabama, Martin Luther King wrote this 5,981 word letter called Letter from a Birmingham Jail. And I've not read the whole letter. It's a six page, single spaced, small font letter. But uh, he's got ideas there that we need to interact with. And let me just read one of them that touches on this notion of living constantly in love. Dr. Kings wrote this, there was a time when the church was very powerful. It was during that period that the early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, please listen to this, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was the thermostat that transformed the mores of society. We, as the church of Jesus Christ, too often become a thermometer rather than a thermostat. But when we live in love, we abide in God, and God abides in us, and we're called to live there constantly. He goes on to say, if the church of today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authentic ring, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning. That's what's at stake in our witness, is a constancy of love. Remember what we talked about last week, Romans 14 says, if you, your brother is grieved because of your food, your liberty, you are no longer walking in love. Constantly is our calling to live in this condition. Secondly, to learn the confidence, the confidence and loving fearlessly. Now, you know, it's, it's very popular to talk about how uh, fear is a liar. And it's been well observed that Jesus' most common command was fear not. It's wonderful that the angel announced the birth of Jesus with that statement, fear not. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Well, sometimes coming to uh, the grip with your fears is quite a battle. Um, sometimes what you suffer in the realm of fear may seem like it's about to annihilate you. It may seem crushing. You may be afraid of people or afraid of certain circumstances or of certain confrontations. And I'm not sure why John, Pastor John, goes all pastoral on us again here, 
But just like when he says, if your heart condemns you, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things, he's saying in this journey towards perfect love, you may encounter fear. And certainly early Christians who were being hunted, uh, believers in certain countries, and even in this country, sometimes we deal with fear. It is uh, not right for some classes of, the, of our culture to fear, perhaps because of their skin color, that they'll be judged ahead of time, prejudged. And yet John has a recipe for whatever the fear is. It is that perfect love casts out fear. Now, I'm going to get into the context of this and, and let it be driven by the context a little more because a, a text without a context is sometimes a pretext for doing something wrong. There is a context here, but I just want to focus a minute on that word casts out. This word cast is the same word that Jesus used, let he who is without sin among you cast the first stone. It's the same word where they pour water. When they're pouring out water, they're casting the water. It's the same word when Jesus says, cast the nets on the other side of your boat and get ready for a catch. It's the same word that's used when Peter throws himself into the water to be confronted by Jesus on the shore. He casts himself. There's something kind of kind of uh, uh, invigorating about thinking when you love people, when you love God, it casts out fear. Now, notice the order here. I think sometimes, and I don't mean to, to insult your intelligence, but what comes first, the love or the casting? Which one is first? The love. I think sometimes we think, well, I'll witness to him when my fear, when I can tamp down this fear. I'll confront my neighbor or maybe just ask him, hey, I, I, I noticed uh, your flag's at half-mast. What, what are you mourning? I'll ask that hard question when my fear is gone. No, that's not the order. Perfect love casts out fear. Now, again, we're not talking about perfect love because I could muster that about 0% of the time. When we say perfect love, we're not talking about love which is absolutely flawless and has no hint of anything human in it. It's Christ-like love. It's mature love. Over and over again, he's saying, if he loved us like this, we also should lay down our lives. We should let the perfect love be take its model from Jesus. But that's the love that will cast out fear. Now, um, let, why is that true? Well, follow, please keep reading, and he explains why it's true. He says, love has been perfected among us in this. Now, uh, let me just say over and over again, John says, by this, in this, the antecedent of this is found in verse 16. And it is that when we abide in love, we abide in God and God in us. In other words, when we walk in love constantly, there is a perfection of love that happens. Now, um, I, I don't mean to, to, to you know, maybe limit this to Bryan College students, but uh, do you know who holds the, uh, the record for the most goals in Bryan College soccer history? Uh, and if I'm wrong about this, I don't want to know, because it was true a few years ago. <laughs> it was a guy from England named Dave Wilson. Dave Wilson had this consummate ability to finish. And sometimes David Wilson uh, would take the team on his back and carry them to victory single-handedly. You can almost see it take place in a certain part of the game. But he had this ability to find the back of the net. And, you know, uh, whether it's uh, Michael Jordan, you know, uh, uh, he was a basketball player of a previous generation, for those of you who don't know. Um, <laughs> defying gravity. Or, or whether it's a baseball player with a, when, you, when you've got the ducks on the pond, the, the, the runners are on the bags, and you need somebody who can bring them in, or whether it's David Wilson just over yonder, I guess it's there, that way, finding the back of the net. There's something beautiful about crossing the finish line. And John says, love has crossed the finish line in us when we abide in love. And then there is this phenomenon that we find fear being cast out. Verse 17, he says, we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Whatever else you do with your theology, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. 
I don't think God is going to be so glib as to say, you had one job. How did you do? But the Bible from the beginning to the end makes this plain that there is going to be this question of, you were made to be the image and likeness of God, and God is love. How did you do with that? We can face that day without fear. And you, you, that, that's what John wants for you, for me. Not that the day of judgment should be a fir- that make you afraid, but that you may have boldness, confidence in the day of judgment. Like a child uh, who is able to uh, uh, burst in uh, to his daddy's office and ask for something. Like a child who can call his parents, his mother, his father at any time. That's the kind of boldness John's talking about here. Confidence. And lastly, there is a consistency in love that we're called to show. Verses 20 and 21. He says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? It's not a coincidence that one of the best novels, and it's, it's a rough read if you, uh, you know, uh, please brace yourself. If you ever read Ralph Ellison's book, Invisible Man, about African-American experience in this country, and he says many times it's like being the invisible man. They see you, but they don't see you. One of my favorite children's books is a book called What Do You See When You See Me? And it's about how the young overlook the old. It's a book how many times when you younger people look at us older people, and I'm closer to 100 than I am to zero, so I'm going to put myself in that category. You younger people look at us older people and um, you see a fossil or you see uh, someone who's past his prime and, and just subtly, somehow elderly people start to become invisible to us. And this book, Who Do You See When You See Me, talks about how this elderly woman was frightened, frightening to this little girl who came to visit the nursing home and she would always uh, say, stop, stop, in this croaky voice. And one time she brought down her cane and almost whacked the little girl and said, stop. And in her croaky voice, she said, who do you see when you see me? And the little girl had to be honest and say, I see something frightening. I see someone I don't want to talk to. She said, you know, I was once young like you. I was in the Olympic trials and swimming. I once loved someone so much that it hurt. And when he kicked World War II, he didn't come back. I used to have limbs that could run like your limbs. Who do you see when you see me? Do you see this body that's here now? And I would say to us Christians, when we see people, do we see pulsing in front of us there the image and likeness of God? Inasmuch as you've not done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've not done it to me. Who do we see when we see the brother? Or whom do we overlook as the invisible man? Or as that person that we in some way dehumanize because she's old or he's a different race or he's one of those people, one of those rednecks, one of those, one of them. And and subtly we give ourselves a pass on abiding in love towards that person. And let me just say again that real love is costly. Romans chapter 8 says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who's even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he goes on a little bit later and he says, For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. This is your destiny. And whom he predestined, these he called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. When Billy Graham's wife was nearing the end of her life about 2007, Uh, She and some family members were driving through a construction zone uh, where they saw road signs warning them of the need to slow down. And at the end of the speed zone, the construction zone, she saw a sign that said, construction finished, thank you for your patience. She arrived home chuckling and telling her family and saying, when I die, 
Please engrave that on my tombstone. Construction finished. Thank you for your patience. You are under construction as a believer, as a follower in Jesus Christ. And God's destiny for you is perfect love. It's mature love. It's maturity like we saw displayed in our graduates. It's maturity when we see a ball cross the finish line or go through the net in a swish or the ball go over the fence in a home run. It's when a human being reaches its goal. And praise the Lord, it happens at Grace Bible Church. By a miracle of God's grace, there is love perfected in this. There are those of you who abide in love. And so God is abiding in you as you cut lawns, as you minister to others. And so by the living of the Holy Spirit in us, by what Jesus has done, we can live the condition constantly. We can learn this confidence fearlessly, and we can leave the contradiction consistency, consistently so that perfect love casts out our fear. Um, there was a folk singer in the 60s, I think, named Barefoot Jerry. And uh, he wrote a song called uh, Time for Love. And uh, a Christian group called Dogwood took it and added one more verse. The song goes something like this. Um, if all we had to do each day was wake up and go out to play and shake the hand of all the world, especially every boy and girl. And then Dogwood added this line. I know Jesus lived and died once for all was crucified and that's been done God's only son who gave us life to make us one and when he does return someday and pass your door along his way and stop and sit down a while to see the beauty in your smile think how very proud you'd be if love was all there was to see just like his father's house above where there is time, only time for love. Let's pray together. Father, we uh, have a long way to go. I have such a long way to go. Perfect love uh, describes us uh, once in a while by your grace. But thank you, this is a condition in which we may abide. Uh, this is a state where we may see ourselves growing bold and confident about the day of judgment because as you are, so are we in this world. You are love and we become love. And Father, I pray also that we would love in a way that's consistent, that takes time to notice the people whom the world forgets in this world. Lord Jesus, perfect your love in us. We pray that you would do that by your Holy Spirit. We pray these things in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we stand and let's sing this together? Sisters, will you join and help us move? 
Moses' sister aided him. Will you help the trembling mourners who are struggling hard with sin? Tell them all about our Savior. Tell them that he will be found. Sisters, pray. Showered all around. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. In his Call us home to heaven At his table we'll sit down Christ will gird himself And serve us with sweet manna All around You'd be seated for just a moment Scripture says, render therefore to all their due, uh, taxes to whom taxes are due. So now it's the time when we're going to tax you. Uh, no. Uh, honor to whom honor is due. Uh, custom to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And we are thankful for officers who are, um, I'm sorry, for members who are coming off our boards, not our officers, we're keeping officers, but members who are coming off our boards and we're going to be honoring them at a banquet that's uh, to come in a few weeks. But tonight, uh, we want to commit to the Lord uh, with prayer and laying on of hands uh, new members of the boards, at least as many as are here. And so I'm going to ask uh, Al Buxton and Jim Vincent and Tim Weesey, our new elders, to come forward. Jim Barth, Bill Carlson, and Steve Honeycutt, our new deacons, to come forward. Judy Barth, Donna Belisle, Jasmine Harner, and Michelle Kleckner, our new deaconesses, to come forward. I'm feeling outnumbered. And our new trustees, Bernie Belisle, Marty Hartzell, Ethan Jones, Tommy Maynard, and Jerry Morgan, if you'd come forward. And then you elders uh, who are continuing, if you'd come forward with me and uh, help me pray for these as well. Uh, please stand alphabetical. <laughs> All right, elders, if you can uh, spread out among them, and uh, let's lay hands on them as we pray for them. And uh, uh, I've done the math, and you may just have to switch hands sometime during the prayer. <laughs> let's pray together. Father, we're so uh, grateful for uh, these uh, who've come forward. And as Deborah sang in Judges chapter 5, when leaders lead in Israel, uh, the people rejoice. And thank you, Father, for the gift of uh, qualified men and women who serve you in strategic ways. And I thank you that each person up here was serving before the office came uh, to him or her. But thank you, Father, that now they uh, set out among us to uh, serve as deacons and elders, as deaconesses and trustees. And so, Father, as we lay hands on them, we recognize, Lord, that we don't have anything to impart beyond what your spirit imparts. But we pray that you would gift them and equip them to serve us and to serve you in effective ways. Father, may they be able to see where needs really lie. May they, Lord, have all grace abound to them so that always abounding in all things, they may have an abundance for every good work. And Lord, I pray that you would work in them what is well-pleasing in your sight and that, Father, you would, would encourage them and that they would walk in the good works that you have prepared beforehand for them to walk in. Thank you for each one. Thank you for those whose places they're taking. Commit them to you today, and Father, pray that you would anoint them with power and with your spirit, and like Stephen, they'd give great witness to the Lord Jesus and be a great blessing to his body, the church. Pray these things in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. amen. Y'all can just remain standing here. I uh, uh, want to just uh, close us with this benediction from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
But before I do that, I'm going to ask that uh, we uh, help uh, and just want to say thank you to especially to uh, Chad and Benjamin Gardner and all of those who set up this uh, auditorium out here and uh, did a lot of work to make tonight happen. Thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. Really appreciate a lot of hard work. And Betty, appreciate the, I'm, I'm going to name names and leave people out, but thank you to Betty and John as well, all those who put in extra time, our, our security team, thank you all. But if we can help them, the chairs are all going to the annex, and you don't have to go in the door, just bring them to the door of the annex, and there'll be people there to help load them into the room where they're going, because we plan to do this uh, for the next several weeks. Um, Jack, yes. Oh, head to the back of the annex. Okay. All right. Any other announcements? Okay. Thank you so much. And so bring those uh, to the back, and we'll get this done in a hurry. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. We're dismissed. <laughs>